I don't want to. But you have to. I know. But, but I don't want to. You can't teach a machine learning course without talking about the normal distribution of the central limit theorem, error bounds, expectation variance standard D. I know I can't teach a machine learning class without teaching those things. Then get to it. Okay, fine. Fine, we'll do it. Fine. Fix my hair here. We're gonna do it. All right, everybody, you are in luck because we've got lesson three on how to evaluate models. This is bounds and comparing models, and we're gonna talk a little bit about some cross-validation in here. Let's get started. Okay, bounds and comparing models. What's the goal? The goal is to know how good is a model. What does good mean? Good means not how well it performs on your computer in the lab where you're training it. Good means how well does it perform when you deploy it and your customers are running it. And so we use data to answer this question. So far we use training data to learn the model parameters, the validation to tune the hyperparameters and stuff like that. And then we've been holding out this test set and I haven't really talked about too much when you would use it or how you would use it, but this is where we start to get into, well, this is the point of the test set. And that is to estimate generalization. Generalization means how well does the model perform on data that it didn't get to see when we trained the model. That all the hyperparameter and the parameter setting were done on one set of data. Now, how well does it perform on a different set of data, which is what's going to happen when you deploy it to your customers. And this is a, a simple point here. Generalization accuracy is not a number. It's a distribution. It's a simple point. but I'll tell you, like, I've worked with a lot of machine learning professionals in my career, and, and many of them are very good, very, very good. They all, like, they create models that get deployed to customers that make people's lives better, that solve problems, that are actually, like, high-quality professional. But I'll say the most common mistake that machine learning professionals make is that they say, well, the accuracy was 72. 72 is a number. We don't need, you know, you're going to see throughout the course of this lecture that there aren't numbers, there are distributions. And so the few machine learning people I had the privilege to work with who are, you know, the best according to like how well they build models that generalize. And here's one of the metrics is, you know, I used to work at a big company, let's not name names and all, but they have these kind of internal AI competitions where anyone in the company can enter and, and try to solve some benchmark problem and whichever team gets the highest accuracy wins or whatever that's for. So, you know, maybe not everyone in the company enters, but a lot of people do enter. And I had the privilege of managing several of the people who they, they formed the team and they repeatedly came in like first place, first place, first place, second place, first place, um, really crushing those types of competitions. And there's a lot of parts to what go into making you an excellent machine learning person. We're going to see many of them, but I'd say one really critical one, one thing that they did that was different from many, many, many of the machine learning professionals I worked with is that they think of all these measurements that you get out of machine learning systems as distributions. So if I went to them and said, oh, the accuracy is 72%, they'd say, well, how many samples did you test that on? Right? Like That's the first thing that comes to mind because telling them 72% doesn't mean anything to them. It's like totally useless. It's like I, if I said, well, what did you have to drink with lunch today? And you said ice. I'd be like, you didn't drink ice. What was, what was with the ice? Oh, lemonade. Lemonade and ice. Okay, tell me lemonade and ice. You can't just say 72%. You have to say 72% and the number of samples are 72% and the confidence interval. And so that's what I mean by generalization accuracy is not a number, it's a distribution. And I've really belabored this point, but it is that important. And I'll tell you straight up, you're going to want to ignore this. You're going to want to not do this. You're going to talk to machine learning people and they're not going to do this. And they're going to be very good at their jobs. But if you want to be very, very, very good, one of the best, start to make your brain work this way. Invest the time. And this lecture is going to go through and tell you the technical tools to be able to understand what that means, but then to also calculate what those distributions are for yourself. What does good mean? Now let's walk through a scenario of how the model is going to move around and what we're actually trying to measure. We'll introduce a little bit of terminology here. So you start off with the data set and that's the training data plus maybe the validation data. You use that to produce a model. Now you're going to say, well, this is the model that we're going to consider deploying to people. So you want to then use this mythical testing data and you evaluate the model on the testing data and you get an estimate of your accuracy. 
or you know the the something related to the operating point that we just talked about and and the operating point stuff is uh, you can you can use this same framework, these same tools to talk about those concepts. But for the rest of this lecture, we're just going to talk about accuracy to keep things a little bit um, simple. Another point here is that when you read the book, I think Mitchell talks about error. Everything is error, error, error. I guess I'm more optimistic than Mitchell. I talk about accuracy, accuracy, accuracy. So right here, what we see is um, accuracy sub s of h. What do those things mean? Well, H is the hypothesis, which is your model. That's the fancy Mitchell talk for, for model is hypothesis. And S is sample. So the accuracy of the model on the testing sample that we have is some number. But that's fine. We've created that. Beautiful. 72, right? <laughs> 72 plus or minus whatever, because we talk about distributions, not numbers. But now we take the model and we deploy it into the performance environment. We load it onto our customers' tablets and they start using it and they have some interactions and then right where my head is, oh, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna have to go to the other screen and we'll say, well, now we have the actual accuracy. After you've run the model on you know, several weeks, a month of your users interacting with it, you get reports back from your users and you start to figure out, well, hey, this model is doing what it's supposed to do. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. And here you would say, this is the accuracy of the hypothesis on D. And D is the true distribution of data that your system is going to bump into when it's in practice in the real world. And so the, the, remember, the S is the sample that you happen to have. And S is a sample drawn from D, trying to mimic D as best possible. Now, here's one fundamental assumption of machine learning algorithms. And it is that the data that we have, all the data is drawn independently and identically distributed from some underlying distribution. So what that means is that this S that you happen to have is drawn from the same process that is the complete underlying distribution. You've just drawn a subsample of it. So that's an important assumption for everything that we're going to talk about in here. And really, all the algorithms sort of assume that that's true, even though it's very clear in the real world that that is not true, as I've said, with time changing concepts. Um, you know, that what that essentially means is the underlying distribution is changing. Let's not get too much deeper into that right now. We'll talk about it a lot more in the future. But now we're going to say, well, how do these two things relate? Let's say accuracy of S of H is 77%, 77 out of 100 correct. Accuracy of H on D is what? Question, question out of 100,000. I mean, now this is, that's what, that's what this lecture is going to help us figure out how to, understand our uncertainty about what those question marks are going to be when we deploy the model, assuming that the underlying distribution doesn't change. And what this means is we're going to have to learn a little bit of statistics. I promise it won't be that hard. It won't be that hard. It won't be that hard. If I say it enough, it'll be true. So let's say you flip a coin and you flip a coin 10 times and see seven heads. Now there's an experiment and you have after doing that, you have some guess that maybe that coin is biased and that instead of being 50-50 in terms of like whether you're going to see a head or a tail, maybe it's 70-30. So you can plot that on this kind of like axis and say, well, you know, I, I did this experiment. I flipped 10 coins, seven of 10 of them were heads. That's what I sort of think the coin, um, the most likely accuracy at this point is 70%. But Let's say we do that experiment again. Flip ten, the coin 10 more times. This time, half of them come up heads, 50-50, five heads. Now we have these two measurements. We flipped 20 coins, not just 10 coins. And we would say that maybe the overall most likely accuracy of this coin is 60%. The probability that it's going to come up heads is 60%. OK, maybe, maybe. But you know, there's kind of a uh, pretty big swing between those two experiments. So then we start to think, well, geez, maybe I should do that experiment just one more time before I, I make up my mind. Ah, there we go, 60%. Now that, that lined up exactly with what we expected. We're done, ship the coin, we figure everything out, unless we flip it 10 more times again, just because we were bored and we wanted to see, and it comes up at 40%. Now you're like, oh, 40%, that's a long way from 60%. So I'm not feeling good about my estimate anymore. But on the other hand, I flipped the coin 40 times and it's 55%. Uh, so maybe that's good. I don't know. Do it some more. 
Let's click ahead, do it some more. We're updating, we're updating, we're seeing a lot of different things. And then finally, you know, after you get bored of flipping it, you might end up with something like this. After n trials or 13 trials or whatever that works out to be, you see that the most likely accuracy for the coin is 50%. Okay, and so if you do this enough time, you end up with a bunch of samples that look like this. Do you? I don't know. Do you? Yes, you do. You absolutely do. Because what we're doing, this type of trial, you end up with what's called a binomial distribution. I'm not going to go through like a ton of detail of why or whatever. If you want to know that stuff, take a statistics class. But doing this sort of experiment ends you up with a binomial distribution. And it turns out that flipping a coin is no different than taking a test sample and figuring out if a model got that test sample right or wrong. With a coin, you're trying to figure out, is this a biased coin? What's the probability I'm going to see heads when I do an experiment from the underlying distribution, which is to just flip a coin? And with a machine learning model, it's let's draw a sample from the underlying distribution. Let's classify it with a machine learning model. And then let's ask some oracle if we were right or wrong. And the, the notion is that there's some underlying thing called like P, which is the true accuracy of that model averaged across the distribution that you're drawing samples from. So there you go. And with a binomial distribution, you have a few things that you just can you like read from a book and say, aha, this is true. And let me just quickly explain what these things are. Um, this is uh, one step on the way to what we're going to actually do in practice. But this is to just show you a little bit of where the things that we're dealing with come from. Um, this mu there is the mean of the distribution. And so it's the expected value of you know, the repeated experiments. And what this really says is that if you do n experiments and the underlying probability of seeing a head or being correct is p, so p could be like, you know, 50%, 0.5 or something like that. So you do n flips and p is the underlying probability, then the expected number of heads that you're going to see across those n experiments is n times p. That's not exactly the accuracy because, you know, it's like how many, this is more like how many you got right instead of saying, well, what's the underlying, what's the uh, measurement you're going to get, but, but that's okay. It's just a, a little starter here. Then we're going to talk about the variance of the distribution, which is like how spread are the individual samples that we've taken, the individual experiments that we've run as we've built up towards seeing an n total experiments. And in this case, the variance is n times p, where p is the underlying probability of heads or underlying probability of correctness, times 1 minus p. There you go. That's the variance. You want to know more about why? Take a statistics class. Enjoy yourself. And then uh, sigma is the standard deviation, which is the square root of the variance in every planet in the known universe. And so it's just take the variance up there and throw it under a square root. And that's how you get the standard deviation of the distribution of the measurements of these samples. OK, and then we want to take a step forward from the binomial distribution. And the tool that's going to let us do that is the central limit theorem. Bam! And I'll tell you, when I was interviewing for my current job, <laughs> the machine learning interview, the first question was, go to the board and tell me what the central limit theorem is. And I, I guess I passed it. Um, it's not like. It could be a technically very demanding question, but it's also conceptually a simple question. And so the central limit theorem says like, look, a distribution of sample means approximates a normal distribution as the sample size gets large. And that's sort of exactly what we were doing on the previous slide is every time we drew another one of these samples, it would say like the distribution of the means of those samples. And in this case, I was showing it with 10 samples but you know, even with one sample, but a distribution of the mean of those samples um, approximates a normal distribution as the sample size gets large. And what's a normal distribution? There you go, normal distribution. Everybody knows what a normal distribution is. There's all sorts of beautiful statistical things that we can do with normal distributions as long as we, you know, we have this approximates. But using the central limit theorem, is going to allow us to calculate the bounds and all the bunch of the other stuff that we're going to do here. And it's also going to allow us to apply these same techniques 
beyond accuracy, beyond like false positive, false negative. But as you're doing machine learning, if you want to put bounds on other entities, this is the thought process that you'd use. Although I'm, I'm pretty sure if you're going to need to go do that, you're going to probably want to read the book very, very carefully and maybe even take a few additional statistics courses before you get off into that territory. But central limit theorem, very important conceptual tool. The distribution of the sample means approximates a normal distribution as the sample size get large, but there's more to it than that. That's step one. But this property is also extremely useful where the average of the sample means is the population mean. So that means where the average of the mean you get from the sample, so that's like the accuracy sub s, is the accuracy sub d. That's like an incredible property. I mean, I guess it makes sense conceptually if you're drawing from the same distribution and you test on 100 things. Um, as the number of things you test on gets really, really, really large, eventually you're going to end up with the accuracy on the true distribution. Uh, you know, thank goodness that that's true. Otherwise, the world would be a much harder place to navigate. But it's a nice thing that we can use. And there it is written down in type instead of in my poor handwriting. Say the accuracy of the hypothesis on the sample is equal to the number that you got correct divided by the number, the total number of samples in your sample. And the most likely accuracy of your model on the entire distribution is equal to the accuracy of the model on the distribution you happen to have. That's the most likely. That's the term you may not have internalized as likely. It has a very precise statistical meaning, which I think as we go through a few slides here, you're going to get a better kind of understanding of what that is. And then when we start to talk a little bit about probabilistic modeling, I think you'll get a much stronger notion of what likely means. But just saying that it's a it's the most probable value, but that also means that other values are possible. It's just that the most probable is the one that you observed on your sample. And here's another property. You, can, you also get a property of the variance of these sample means that you observe. And that property is that the variance of the sample means is proportional to the underlying property of population variance. So here's the um, variance, the standard deviation, right? The square root of the variance again. And here I say that the, um, the standard deviation in the accuracy observed on the sample is, here's how you would calculate that, and that that's proportional to the population variance, which is great. And there is an another, you know, we have this, this um, approximation of the central limit theorem. And then here's another approximation of substituting in this accuracy as we're calculating the standard deviation. It's just, a, it's just a little approximation, but it's what you gotta do because it's what you have. Okay, so then the next question is, what is like approximates a normal distribution as the sample size gets large? What does large mean? <clears throat> well, there's two ways to think about large. One is where your sample size gets greater than about 30. So that's to say, if your test set is larger than 30 samples, you're in the ballpark where let's just go ahead, use the central limit theorem, use these approximations, party on. I've seen other places that this is not super accurate for, for very high and very low probabilities, underlying probabilities, true probabilities of your accuracy sub D of your hypothesis. So here's another thing that you could use is that it's actually maybe N times whichever is worse for you you know, if your accuracy is hyper low or if your accuracy is very near to one. And so as you get more and more into that region, you want to have more and more samples to test things. But in even, you know, this might have been a, a more important constraint when Mitchell wrote his book, because nowadays, if you have 30 test samples, I don't know what you're doing. Like nobody has 30 test samples. I never heard of that. You're going to have hundreds. You're going to have thousands. I mean, you're going to have tens of thousands. So the point of that is that this normal distribution approximation of the property that we're trying to say something about is almost always the right thing to do. Don't worry about it. Don't think about it too much. But now you know, now you have some of the background there. 
So let's give a little bit of intuition about what does this mean. And remember, I just pulled this from the previous slide, the accuracy itself and the standard deviation of the accuracy. And it's uh, like the observed correct out of 100 if your true accuracy is 50%. So that's, you know, in terms of the other things, that's P equals 50%. And here's the distribution that you'd have. And now th what this says is that your probability of seeing 50 heads or 50 correct is something like 8%. The probability of seeing 60 correct is something like 1%. And remember I said likely, the most likely outcome. Well, that, that right there is the most likely outcome. You know, if you're going to say, well, what is it? There it is. It's the most likely thing to happen. And then, you know, here I've plotted the variance which you've calculated according to this. And the reason for this slide is to show you this next thing. Now let's say that your accuracy is 90% instead of 50%. So you'd say the um, most likely outcome here is that you're going to see 90 correct, 90 heads if you have a 90% accuracy. And the probability of that is something like 13%. And you see here, you got more of a, a higher peak than you did up there. And that's because of looking at the variance or the standard deviation. Because think of it this way. If your model is 100% correct, there is no variance. Everything's correct. That's zero variance. Everything is correct, correct, correct. Heads, 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 no variance. If your model is 50% correct, then if you take you know two samples, you would expect to see one that's a zero and one that's a one. That's high variance. And here's just a simple plot of that, which shows um, the if you your accuracy here, the number correct is 100, then this dotted line kind of shows you how the standard deviation changes as the number correct changes. And, and you know, it's pretty like the highest variance is when your accuracy is the least certain. If you're hyper unaccurate or hyper accurate, the var variance is very low and then it kind of, you know, it falls off there and there. And this line is just the accuracy, which, you know. Okay, looking at this from the other direction, I gave you a little bit of that when I was talking about likelihood on those previous two charts. But imagine you know the model is 50% accurate and you test it on 100 samples. What's the probability of seeing 50 correct out of those 100 samples? I mean, that's, that's the true accuracy. That is the right answer in the cosmic sense. And the probability of seeing that right answer is just 8%. Just 8%. So if you do it like 10 times, you're going to see the right answer just once. Put it another way, 92% chance you're going to observe an accuracy on your sample that is not right. It is not the correct accuracy. 92%. What the heck? And this is why thinking about these distributions is so very important. You could ask the same question about other things. Well, what's the probability of seeing 40 correct, which is, you know, quite wrong. A 40% accuracy reading instead of a 50% accuracy reading. Well, the probability of that exact mistake is about 1%. And then you'd have another, you know, 1% chance to see 60 instead of 50. So, you know, to be that far off, you have a 2% chance of being exactly 10% wrong in your measurement. That's kind of big, I don't know. Um, probability of seeing 55 correct is about 4.8%. So you know, these probabilities go up, and so you're more likely to probably see something in that region, but every once in a while, you'll see one correct. I mean, it's very, 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 very astronomically low, but if you draw enough samples at random from the true underlying distribution and test your model on them, eventually you're going to see the correct accuracy is 50. You're going to estimate that the accuracy of your model is 1%. It'll happen if you do machine learning long enough, I promise. So what are you going to do? What we need to do is figure out, well, how do we reason about these distributions so that we can make good decisions about our modeling process in a world where truth is truth and our ability to measure the true accuracy of our model is, ac is quite limited, actually very, very limited. And confidence bounds is a tool that we use to do this. 
we can't know the true accuracy of the model. I mean, legitimately, you can't know it, but you can bound the true accuracy. So if we do a single um, test on 100 samples and we observe a 40% accuracy, we use that normal approximation of all the stuff that we've been talking about. So now we have some tools. The probability a model with a true accuracy of 40% generated the observation is 8%. We learned that on the previous slide. Maybe the variance would be a little bit different, so it might be a little bit off. Maybe that's a slight bug, that, that, but it's, it's in the ballpark of 8%. But now what if we want to say, well, it's OK if we make a mistake. Well, we don't want to make a big mistake. What's the probability that the true accuracy of the model that generated this observation is between 35 and 45% accuracy? And now we can add up all those probabilities, and we'll see that the the probability of that is 75%. That is the probability that we got this, plus the probability we got that, plus the probability we got that, plus blah, 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 blah. 75% itself isn't even that large. So we'd say like, geez, maybe we would need to have an even wider bound than a 10% range in the accuracy of our model if we only have these 100 samples to work on. 100 samples is just not enough to get a refined enough estimate of what this model's probability is so that we can effectively learn a good model and make progress. So let's do it though. Let's go and have a, uh, a wider bound. This time it's, what is that, like 15%, something along those lines. And would say that the probability of that is 99%. 100 samples, 40% accuracy. In order to be 99% sure, you have to have like a 22, 20%, something in that ballpark, bounds of the error to say, my true model is somewhere between 27% accurate and 52% accurate, but I can't be any more accurate about it than that. Makes it hard to make decisions. That means if you're, you know, like, uh, should I ship this? Uh, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> All right, so let's move on. Now, how do you do this? The normal distribution um, is convenient because it's been highly, highly studied. And this is just the standard confidence bound stuff on normal distributions. And what you're able to do is say the observed accuracy, so that's accuracy S. I probably should have had the S there. The upper bound here is the that accuracy plus this magical Z value times the standard deviation of the accuracy. And the magic Z value comes from a lookup table, which relates to the probability mass of a normal distribution. So if you want a 95% confidence interval, you draw from this table 1.95 times the standard deviation of the accuracy, plus the accuracy is the upper bound minus the accuracy, you know, subtract that from the accuracy and you get your lower bound, where, you know, this is the upper bound, that's the lower bound. So there you go. You can find bigger versions of this table, I think. In the sample code I gave you, I think I've given you this table with um, many more values in it. I'm not sure. There's, there's more values in your book and there's more values on the web. That's for darn sure. All right, here we go. Confidence interval example. Something for you to work through a little bit. Let me show you the first one here. Um, here's everything. I pulled them up from the previous slide so that we have what we need. Let's say we evaluate our model on 100 samples. We see 15 correct, so that's an accuracy of 15%. The standard deviation I calculated for you there because maybe you don't have a calculator or something like that, I don't know. Uh, we wanna get a 95% confidence interval. And we'll, in a few slides, we'll get into like why you might want a particular interval, at least a little bit, but you draw that value from the table. So it's 1.96. Um, Kind of close to two, but you basically take the standard deviation of the accuracy, multiply it by this, kind of close to two, so you're sort of at like 7%. So the interval width would be um, 15 plus or minus 7%, 8 to 22. Um, and that would be your interval. But we say the interval width, I maybe that's a little bit of a sloppy term. Maybe that should be, um, it's not the full interval, it's the bound away from the accuracy. The bound up and the bound down is about 7%. So let me erase some of my gibberish stuff here. We'll go on to the next one. Because we'd say, well, geez, that's not good enough. We need to do much better. Let's get a thousand samples. And um, 
accuracy 50%, correct 500, and we can see the standard deviation of the accuracy is 1.5%. If we need the 95% confidence interval again, that's going to be 3%, so it would be 47 to 53. Like a thousand samples, even in the worst possible case for the variance, remember the, the variance is the worst at the 50% accuracy, that's usable. So let's click this thing and be like, okay, 3%. Math. But let's, let's look at even more samples, 10,000 samples in your test set, standard deviation of the accuracy. So your 95% confidence bound at that point is about 1%. But then let's say, well, 95%, who are we kidding? We want 99%. And then you have to multiply it by 2.5. So that's, you know, 1.5%, something in that ballpark. Oh, okay, well, it's not exactly in that ballpark, but it's a little bit in that ballpark. And so there you go. And that's the sense in which a really good machine learning person, when they hear somebody say, my accuracy is 74%, that doesn't matter. What matters is the combination of like this, right? Plus minus the accuracy. Very important to make good decisions. Now, here's the summary of this first part of the talk, which is about error bounds. You can't know a model's true accuracy when evaluating on a sample. You simply cannot. And we've seen through a few examples here that the true accuracy can be quite a bit different from the observed accuracy. Even when you're testing on 100, 200, 1,000 samples, there can be quite a lot of difference. And so we can use the central limit theorem to give the relationship between the true accuracies and the accuracies observed on a sample by approximating that distribution with a normal. And then we can use that to do confidence bounds and calculate the probability of a model with X percent true accuracy generating a sample accuracy of Y. And then we can take this set of, you know, this ability to estimate the probabilities for any particular possibility and kind of sum them up and get error bounds to say, well, what's the probability um, that the true accuracy of my model is more than a particular amount away from what I've observed? And then we can use that to make decisions that are um, more confident than just this 8% most likely estimate, which is the observed accuracy on the sample. And that gets back to this point of generalization accuracy is a, not a number, it's a distribution and that you need to think about those distributions, especially when we're talking about all those nested loops and we create that accuracy. All right, part one, error bounds. So we know some technical tools for saying, I've observed some accuracy, what do I actually know? Now, that's great and all, but it would be perfect if somebody dropped a model out of a cloud and said to you, machine learning person, should I deploy this model or not? then you could use those, find the error bounds, make a decision based on what experience, you know, the bound on what experience that might cause for your customers. But that's not what happens. That, there's no cloud, you're the cloud. Your for loops of creating all these models and figuring out which one's best, that's what you need to do. And so it's not enough to know for a model in isolation how good it is it. I mean, that's a, that's a thing to do. It's an interesting thing to do. It's an important thing to do. But what you're gonna be doing a lot of the time is actually saying, heck, I have these two models, which of them is better? So here's an example. You take your training and validation data and you build a new model. So let's say your previous model was this tree thing and you go and you try to do a logistic regression because maybe logistic regression is going to be better. Now you evaluate them both. So you have the accuracy on the sample of the tree, the accuracy on the sample of the linear model, and you want to know if you're going to deploy them, what is the accuracy how, like, how do these things relate and what's the chance that the accuracy of the linear model on the true distribution is actually equal or better than what you were getting with the tree that you currently have shipped. You don't wanna ship something that's worse by accident because it happened to look better on your sample because of all the error bound stuff that we saw. So right, the question is to deploy or not to deploy. So you can compare models but when you do it, you don't compare point accuracies. You have to compare the distributions. And you have to, and one way to do that is to pick some confidence intervals and do something simple. I mean, it looks a little bit simple, but we'll get through some examples. So if, and this is how you do it, if the better model, and what do I mean by better model? It's the model whose accuracy on the sample, the most likely value is higher. 
And the worst model is the model whose accuracy on the sample, the most likely value is lower. Remember the, the peak of the distribution? But that's also the same as saying the model whose accuracy measured on the sample is better or worse. Just throwing in those terms so you can start to understand a little bit more of what's going on. But anyway, you take the better model and you subtract the confidence bound for it at whatever confidence level you want, 90% or something like that, 95%. Then you take the worst model and add the confidence bound. And if the better model is better by both of those, then that would be like there's a 95% chance that both of those confidence intervals held. And you'd say there's a 95% chance that the model that looks better actually is better. But that also means that there's a 5% chance that the model that looks better is not actually better. Okay, what are you gonna do about it? Right, so there you go. Then with an X percent confidence, the one that looks better is better. So let's walk through a little bit of an example of what this looks like. And would say, here's the two models. The uh, better model has a 98% most likely accuracy. And the worse model has an 80% most likely accuracy. So we have to say, well, with 100 samples, um, we're going to use a 95% confidence interval. And so right here, you have everything you need to calculate what that band is, that bound is. Go ahead and try it. Try it. Try these. I'll do them. We can do them together, or you can pause and do it and then see if your thing lines up with my thing. But would say, okay, 100 samples, blah, blah, blah. What's the bound? So this is the most like this is the um, lower end of the 95% confidence interval for the better model. And I believe it's going to plot over there. There you can see the um, confidence interval where the, you know, the, the lower bound and the upper bound are written over there. The worst model, if you take the 80% and add the bound, you end up with that. And so if we plot that, you'd see that there's a really a large region of overlap. And again, what that means is that the better model is 95% likely to be in that region, 5% likely to be out of the region. The worst model is 95% likely to be in that region, 5% to be out of that region. So there's a significant overlap, and you cannot say with 95% confidence that the model that looks better on your sample is actually going to be better on the true distribution. Maybe you'd still ship it, maybe you don't. We'll talk later on about some of that thought process, but you at least cannot make that statement. Right, so there is a um, more than 5% chance that the model that looks worse is actually better. And remember, if the bounds don't overlap at all, then there still would be that 5% chance, but there you go. Um, if we up the number of samples we use in the test set, then we would get these values, the lower bound of the better model and the upper bound of the worse model, and there's still a little bit of overlap. And then let's move on and say, well, what do we have to do? Let's go to 1,000, and with 1,000, boop, there you go, thing of beauty. There's a gap. There's a gap between them. So you'd say that there is at least, based, now that you've used 1,000 samples to estimate the accuracy of these things, there is at least a 95% chance that this one that looks better is actually better. There might, you know, if the things were closer, you might say there is a 95% chance. Here the chance is greater than 95% chance. We don't know how much greater. You could, um, you could try different Z values to calculate, you know, what, what are the bounds where they actually just touch at that point and then you'd know, but that's often not important. What's more important is just that you use this thought process as a tool to not lead yourself astray and not optimize in circles where, you know, if you're, if you're making decisions about your hyperparameters in a world like this, this uppercase here, you could really be chasing your tail where, you know, like optimize, go multiple times through that loop of trying different hyperparameters, trying different feature things. Well, all sorts of stuff is looking better by chance. And it's very hard for you to get a clear signal of what's the right direction to change my hyperparameters to make things better. That's an important reason for all of this confidence interval stuff um, and including this in your thought process and in your modeling process. But you can actually do a little bit better in practice and that's something called a one-sided bound. And the notion is like down here, this is, um, let's just say we've got a 95% confidence interval drawn there for the two models that we're comparing. The bounds don't overlap. I mean, it's hard to see, but let's just pretend like those things aren't overlap. So we can say that the better model is 
at least is 95% likely to be better than the worst model. Um, and remember, that's because we have this distribution drawn like this. And based on our sample observation, it's 95% likely that the model that generated that sample observation comes from that range that I've just drawn there. But now if we go a little bit forward, we can see that, what does that mean? What that means is that 95% chance of being there, 5% chance of not being there, 2.5% of the probability mass is out there, 2.5% of the probability mass is out there. So there's a 2.5% chance that this model is actually better than we thought and a 2.5% chance that it's actually worse. Now, if you're doing a comparison and it turns out that the model is actually worse, if the worse model is actually worse or worse than we thought the worse was, or if the better model is actually better, better than we thought the better model was better, then that doesn't matter, right? Like it's in the right, it's the type of mistake that is in the correct direction that actually would affirm your thought that the better model is better, not cause you to have made a mistake that's meaningful. So what you could do is, is just only take the probability mass from this the side that matters. And so a 95% confidence interval for a two-sided bound turns into a 97.5% one-sided confidence interval when you're just looking at, is this thing better than that thing? You just have to take you know the half. You get, you get double the confidence kind of for free. All right, now there's a bunch of ways that we could integrate this type of information, this comparing model technique into our modeling process. I'm gonna show you one here and then I'll, I'll quickly sketch another one over the top of, of this. But you'd say like, let's say there's a model that's in production. That is the model that I shipped yesterday. But today I wanna to build a new model because maybe I've got more data. Maybe I've done more feature engineering. Maybe it's just part of my process that every day I build a new model. And then I want to ship the new model because shipping isn't like free. Shipping's never free. There's always a risk. So I only want to ship the new model if it's like better than the model that's currently in production. Or, or maybe I want to turn that around and I want to ship the new model unless I'm pretty certain that it's worse. So you, that's another, I'll leave that as an exercise for you to figure out how to use those bounds to say like, I don't want to ship this model unless I'm 95% sure it's not a lot worse than the model that's currently in production. All right, but so anyway, you take the current production model, you evaluate it on your test data, and here's a function that you know includes that bound stuff into the evaluation process. And in the framework code, I think it's a little bit different than this. I think I updated the framework code and didn't update the slide, so sorry about that. But you know, you input the confidence target, 95%, whatever. Now you say, well, that's the upper bound on the current production model. So if I want to ship something new, I want to beat its upper bound. Otherwise, I'm, you know, I'm just shipping kind of at random. Or you could look at the other way, like I said, and just make sure you're not losing to its lower bound by too much. So now you do your same model tuning loop that we've talked about on the previous slides, evaluations creation, the blah, blah, blah. You probably insert the feature selection stuff here too, but I've left it out for now. When that's done, you build the best model that you can that you find that you're able to do. And then you call evaluate with lower bounds, which is kind of the dual of this function there with the same confidence target. And so this is the lower bound of the accuracy of the new model that you've learned for today. And if the new accuracy lower bound is greater than the current accuracy's upper bound, deploy the model and there's your confidence, a confidence divided by two because you only need the one-sided bound. Otherwise, just stick with the current model because you can't be sure it's better and you don't want to waste your time. Okay, so that's one way to use this, but uh, if you're a careful observer, which I'm certain every one of you is, you would see that we're doing this thing right here. What the heck? Here we have the accuracies for the hyperparameters equals evaluate. There's no distribution there. That's just the point estimate. That's what I've been warning you about. This is actually a very potentially harmful thing to do might not look so bad in a single loop of try every hyperparameter once, but as you get into more sophisticated search processes to try to find the best hyperparameters, and especially as you start to nest these loops more and more and you're doing the feature selection stuff, the hyperparameter stuff, you like other things that we're gonna talk about in the cross-validation we're gonna get to in a second, there's a lot of chances for the accuracy you observe on the sample to not be the, like, within the bound of the true accuracy of whatever model you happen to be building here. So doing this type of process, you're, you know, unless you're careful, you're gonna be likely to be chasing your tail 
where a whole bunch of models are within the bound of each other. And just based on random factors, one of them happens to look better than the other and the other happens to look better than the other. So you might be, you might be running your optimization process until it converges, like until no change makes things look better, but you might find by chance it's better, by chance it's better, by chance it's better, by chance it's better. And it's, you know, let's say common, whatever, to have a whole bunch of the parameters, the hyperparameters, the feature selection parameters that you're trying be indistinguishable from each other according to your statistical power that you have because of the size of your sample. Mm -hmm. And at some point you want to give up. You don't want to optimize things that you can't see. This is where I was saying the people who are really, really good at this think in this way, and they have a great intuition about setting up the hyperparameter search, watching the hyperparameter search, and then making good decisions about how to evolve that search based on the fact that they understand the power of the questions they're able to successfully ask. So you might want to do something here where you'd say like, look, if I run two of these things and the distributions overlap, I'm going to break the tie somehow. I'm going to take the one that requires the requires less runtime to do, or I'm going to just stop my optimization, not when nothing looks better, but instead stop my optimization when the bounds start overlapping. That's probably a better way to, to look at the process. So, okay, that's how to use this to make decisions. And I, you know, I sort of made this point in the hyperparameter search, but machine learning does a lot of tests for each type of feature selection, for each hyperparameter setting, for each model structure you try, if you're trying decision trees and logistic regression and other things that we're talking about, each of those is a test where you create a model, evaluate it on the sample, and then you say, well, I have a 95% chance that the true accuracy of my model is within this bound, but the true accuracy could be way, way, way out of the bound. The case that you need to worry about there is that you do one of the runs and you get a model that is out of the bound on the way optimistic side. So it looks way better than it actually is. And you end up deploying a model that's much, much worse because of just these statistical properties. And one way to think about it is that, you know, like if you're going to say in order for the model that I spit out at the end of my modeling process to actually be the best among all the models I tried, every single statistical test has to have held. They all needed to be within their 95% thing. Otherwise, um, I probably am not returning the best in practice. And so now you're saying, well, what's the probability that all the tests are going to hold? If you're doing one test, it's 95%. If you're doing a 95% confidence bound, if you're doing 10 tests, you're down to 60%. If you're doing 100 tests, you're down to like, it's not, it doesn't hold. If you're doing 1,000 tests, it's like, no, it, it's not a thing. So all your bounds will not hold. Sometimes doing more search for more hyperparameters is actually counterproductive because you're going to start hallucinating. Um, and that's just a thing about machine learning, a pain in the butt, why it's, um, you know, you, you have all this data, all this power, all these magical machines, and you can't optimize the things you want to optimize. Another thing you could do is try a much stricter bound. Remember, then the, the bounds are going to be much, much wider. But if you used a 99.9% .9 bound, and you did a thousand tests, like you needed 1,000 statistical tests to hold, you have a 36% chance that all of them held and that the model you spit out at the other end actually is the best. Now, all of this is like, okay, whatever. Like, right, Jeff, really? Like, what, what, how are we ever supposed to do anything? And that's sort of the answer is that these statistical tests are to help you think through what's going on. You don't need every statistical test in the entire modeling process to hold in order to deploy something to production. You don't need it at all. And you, another way to think about that is that when you deploy a model to production, you're essentially never deploying the actual best, <laughs> right? There's a better model there. Your modeling process might have even created it and you discarded it because of statistical properties. And that's okay. That's just part of what you need to fight. You don't have enough time to build every model you want to build. You don't have time to calculate every feature you want to calculate. You don't have enough data to statistically know what the best thing is. It's like one of these magical like, ah, things. But, and, and this is why now I think you're in a position to see why we have the training set, the validation set, and the test set, and why it's important to keep your test set quite pristine. So you can go off, you learn a bunch of parameters on the training set, you do all this 
thousand time optimization on hyperparameters and you know you have a very low chance that you're actually finding the best hyperparameters you're probably hallucinating in some way whatever that's fine but you've preserved this pristine test set and you're only going to use the test set one two three times so that you're you're much closer to this actual 95 or 99.9 percent .9 when you're saying well here's the model i'm really going to deploy all the statistical shenanigans I did before this point, forget about them, but now I have a pristine sample. I'm gonna evaluate the generalization potential of this model that I'm thinking of deploying to my customers tomorrow. That's what the test set's for. And that's why it's really so important to keep those things separate and to understand how statistics is working against you in machine learning. But it's okay, you're gonna do fine. Now, let me walk through one more thing that you can do to put yourself in a better position. And that is called cross-validation. Now, cross-validation um, takes a good amount of time. It makes even another layer of loops to this feature selection, hyperparameter selection, cross-validation, and you, you just nest another factor of N there. But it does two pretty awesome things. Number one, it gives you more samples to estimate your generalization accuracy. So it lets you do a better job at picking the right hyperparameters, just lets you get a little bit further. That's important. But another thing it does is it lets you test the variance of the hyperparameter settings themselves. Right? Like up to this point, we've been talking about now you have a model, what is the actual accuracy, accuracy sub D, accuracy on the true distribution of this model that I produced? But instead, what we're going to say is now I have this modeling process what is the accuracy that this modeling process is going to spit out at the other end? And, you know, how do I make sure that there's not a lot of variance in that? And, and let me tell you, like, where does variance come from? Let's say you have a feature selection method and the training data that you're using um, provides you with the available tokens or it provides you with the mutual information between the various features and the labels. And so by changing the training data, it's not just that you get a different model, but you actually get a different set of features. And so each of those changes introduces some more variance and, and you could produce a significantly different model. So cross-validation has those two things. It gives you more power to look at ver um, the generalization, but it also gives you some protection against the fact that your modeling process is introducing variance and that um, that would tend to make your estimates of the accuracy for your generalization thing not as good. Okay. Now, let me, let me just add one more thing there. Okay, right? Like, okay, like, huh, one more little point. And that is that often you're not going to have time to repeat that whole hyperparameter search thing every time you're going to ship a new model. You're going to want to pick, like, here's the hyperparameters I'm using, right? Like, this is it, right? I, I've done the weeks of work. This is what we're going with. And that's a reason why using this sort of evaluation that includes cross-validation would help you know, and I picked those right hyperparameters. So I'm gonna feel safe locking those in and using those for the foreseeable future. All right, so cross-validation, what does it mean? How do we do it? And here's a layout of what we've been doing before. You have your training data. You might train a model with and without the feature that you're evaluating or with one hyperparameter setting versus another hyperparameter setting, all the discussion that we had. Use the validation data to figure out, is there a chance that this, this new thing I'm trying or you know, that one of these is better than the other? If the bounds overlap, you know, one thing you could say is like, I'm stuck, I'm gonna stop optimizing because I no longer have the power to distinguish these two things. They're, they're just too similar, I don't have enough data. But let's talk about how we can use cross-validation to get more data. What if we split our data into K folds and then we trained with and without the feature, you know, or whatever we're evaluating here, like I, I talked about right up here, we train with and without it on K minus one of those folds and then validate on the remaining data. So in some sense, these two things are equivalent, except conceptually, maybe we've merged the validation data back in and we've treated it as, you know, just one fold of the training data. So that's fine. Okay, we've done that. Well, look at what we could do. We could do that again. We could take each fraction of this data set and treat it as the validation data while we use all the remaining data as training data. And in that sense, by the time we've, we've done with this, we've validated on every possible sample in all of the training data. So that means that we've now 
our n, instead of just being this portion, our n is now the entire size of the training data that we had available. The other thing that we've done, as I was talking about, the um, is, is that we've, we've done feature selection on different sets of data. So, you know, if there's a token that only appears in one of these sections, we'll only get it in the training set, you know, not every time, and we'll, we'll have to deal with that form of variance and stuff like that. So now we've done that evaluation. Now we pull all those validation sets together, essentially saying every single sample in our available data, we've built a model for it, and we've evaluated that model on that sample. And then you can just do the same stuff just like that because you've done an independent evaluation. You've trained a model for each sample that didn't see that sample and tested how well it generalized on that sample. So you can do everything we talked about before except now n is larger. And you get a better lower variance estimate, tighter bounds, but you also get the extra variance that comes from this part of the process. So you, at the end of it all, you have more power to estimate what you're doing and you're doing a better job of estimating what you really want to be estimating. And of course, reserve the test set so that at the end of all of these shenanigans, you can actually say, well, whatever I sput out, spat out, sput, spat, spit, sput out, what is this going to do for my customers? And here's some pseudocode. This is something you are going to have to implement. You're not going to need to run it every time. And the only reason that in your assignments you don't have to run this every time is that it takes more time. So if you were going to do machine learning professionally, you probably generically generally want to do something like cross-validation. We'll get, we'll get into a few reasons why it's not always usable, but you probably always want to do something like that. Um, but for these assignments, man, you, you're going to get old. We all have lives you can skip it where I say you can skip it, but there's a few times where you actually have to do it. So for I in the number of folds you want to use, get all data except the fold, right? So it's this is a little helper function that looks at your training and evaluation data and pulls out everything except the fold that you're going to evaluate on. Then you get the data in the fold and you call that your validation data. And then at this point, you can just do everything that you are going to do. Fit it, evaluate it, and in the evaluation, with the cross-validation, remember, you, you count the total number correct across all the different validation sets and divide it by the total size of all the data that you have. And that would be your accuracy. And if you're calculating other statistics, exercise for the reader, view, or whatever, you can figure out how to do that. So there you go, the length of the original training set. Then, of course, you do the bounds. OK, when to use cross-validation. When you need to measure the variance in the modeling process, feature selection on different data sets creates variance, building models on different data creates variance, you know, um, just the, the gradient descent or what parameter optimization you do, there'll be variance just caused by the data being different. And then some machine learning algorithms do also include randomization. Neural networks is a good case of this, but um, it's not the only case of this, where you could run the same hyperparameter settings, everything exactly the same, but the randomness within the uh, parameter initialization of the model could result in drastically, drastically different things. And you're going to want to know if that's happening before you decide which hyperparameters you're going to go with, which model structure you're going to go with. And here's some things to be careful of. The data that we're using, I think, in all of our problems is really a pretty IID. That's what I say. It's independently, identically distributed. That means each sample was drawn from the true underlying distribution with no reliance on what's come before or, or whatsoever, what's come after. But that's often not the case in the real world. And one, one big thing that can cause that is a time series. Like if your data collection process is by looking at a log that one of your systems is collecting, that means that data that comes in tomorrow is actually from the world tomorrow. That world tomorrow might be different than the world today. And if you do cross-validation and use data from like tomorrow to build the model and use data from last week to evaluate the model and your underlying problem is changing a lot day by day, you could see some wonky stuff. One example of this would be like weekend behavior versus weekday behavior. Those can be extremely different. So you have to think about those sorts of dependencies in your data when deciding what should I use for cross-validation. Now, an alternative to cross-validation is if you have a time series Instead of taking your data and splitting it into five parts and just like shuffling them back and forth like this, you could look at your data as a continuum 
And like this is today's data, there's yesterday's data, the day before, the day before, the day before, the day before, the day before. And you could simulate going back in time and training a model on this day. So you could train on that data and evaluate just on the next day's data. Then you could then simulate going back to that point. Then you could then simulate going back to that point. So in this sense, you could do a similar thing for to cross validation not maybe quite as good, but it, it gives you more ways to evaluate, hey, would this new modeling process have performed well at many more points? And it also captures some of the variance in the distribution changing of your problem. So, so that's something to think about. Um, there could be other violations of independence assumptions, like let's say um, some of your records are from a log and you have the same user. So, so you don't wanna do a cross validation where you take all of my purchasing history and put some of it where in the data you're training and some of it in the data you're evaluating, you might want to look at, well, what are these dependencies? And don't cross-validate your samples, but cross-validate your dependencies. Say, Jeff is only in one fold. He's only ever in one fold. He'll never span across folds. So we'll never have a chance of training on Jeff and evaluating on Jeff, which would lead us to be over-optimistic. Okay, so that's cross-validation. Now, a summary of this entire three-part lecture, remember we talked about um, error bounds, comparing models, and cross-validations. So you've got to use statistics to know the relationship between model quality on training data and the model quality on the true concept. And by training data, I mean train validation and test set. You need to use those data points carefully, and you need to use statistics so you can understand what have I really done here and how is this going to show up in the real world. One side of bounds can give probability one model is better than another on the true concept. And this is, remember, the normal assumption, normal distribution assumption, and these are the pretty standard things you do for confidence intervals. You can find them on the internet, la-di-da. That's how you do it. Cross-validation is a standard technique to get more statistical power of your training data and to measure your modeling process as well as just measuring a particular model. And now I get to make this point one more time, maybe one more time, maybe I'll stop saying it after this, I doubt it, maybe, I doubt it, I doubt it, I doubt it. But the point is that when modeling, don't think in terms of point accuracies, think in terms of distributions of possible accuracies. And doing this is one of the key things I see in practice between professional competent modelers and the actual best modelers. The best modelers understand the statistics of what questions they're able to ask and successfully answer and they design their approach to the problems that they're dealing with with that intuitive understanding of what the possible is because of statistical properties. So there you guys go. Interesting lecture, I hope. Very important um, that these concepts just become second nature and intuitive for you when you look at making decisions. And I will see you next time.